Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Katie Murray uh, at NYU Langone and here to talk about the new updated or first time AUA guidelines um, and a review of upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Um, I don't, um, uh, here's listed as my consulting disclosures. Um, you know, we're going to quickly review um, as high yield. Uh, diagnosis, evaluation, risk stratification of upper tract disease, as well as treatments and recommended follow-up. So upper tract urothelial carcinoma, right? It's 2023. It's still considered a rare malignancy, although as urologists, oftentimes uh, it doesn't feel rare. Um, but just to put it into perspective, you know, there's less cases of upper tract disease than there are of testicular cancer each year. Uh, biggest risk factor, of course, with urothelial carcinoma was smoking with a two to four times increased risk over those who are non-smokers. And then, of course, one of the other big risks of patients who have a prior history or ongoing history of bladder cancer, radiation exposure, chemical exposures, um, as listed here, as well as hereditary disease, uh, with the most common being Lynch syndrome. Uh, within Lynch syndrome, this is uh, upper tract disease is the third most common cancer. So I think it's important for us, you know, as urologists, we often talk about urothelial carcinoma being um, uh, the same wherever it is within the urinary tract, upper tract, or lower tract. But um, although we we often think of that, you know, uh, upper tract disease is very different than lower tract disease. Uh, embryologically different, um, the uh, grade and stage at presentation. Um, so for upper tract disease, a majority of patients are diagnosed with high grade disease, around seventy percent. Um, very rarely have uh, variant histologies of the upper tract. Um, it's genomically different. And then, of course, with our causative factors, with the Lynch syndrome um, being quite important. So the AUA came out uh, with guidelines in 2023. So... Uh, until this point, we didn't have any guidelines, um, so it's very exciting for us um, that kind of runs us through how to treat these patients, and obviously this is high yield for anybody preparing for boards or in-service examinations. So in patients with a sus suspected upper tract disease, of course, uh, they're recommended to have a cystoscopy and cross-sectional imaging with uh, focus on that delayed image of the upper urinary tract. So a CT urogram is, is the number one that we often think think about, but can also be replaced with an MR, uh, retrograde pilograms, um, renal ultrasound. And this is just a reminder that 17% of patients, you know, will have concurrent um, bladder as well as upper tract. So just because you see a bladder tumor um, in a patient with hematuria doesn't mean that you can't evaluate uh, the upper tract. Um, patients who have both uh, upper tract and lower tract concomitant disease, um, so uh, it can be managed in the same setting. I think there's historically been a question, do you have to do the TURBT first and then proceed to the upper tract or vice versa? Um, and, but I, expert opinion is, is that they both can be done in a single operation, um, and then it's up to the treating physician if you want to do that upper tract before the TURBT or vice versa. Um, in cases of patients with ureteral stricture disease or difficult to access upper urinary tracts, um, you know, cl clinicians should minimize the risk of any injury to the ureter. Um, so this would be uh, gentle dilation, such as temporary stenting, um, but avoid the use of very aggressive dilation, such as balloon uh, dilation or ureteral access sheath dilation. Um, and in those patients who, in which you still are unable to get a safe ureteroscopy at a second attempt, you can do selective upper tract washings or barbitage for cytology, uh, along with retrograde pilography uh, when you can't get that good axial CT imaging. Um, and then as long as you have a CT scan, it is not recommended to do a ureteroscopy on the normal appearing kidney on the other side. So focus on the side that you're worried about. 
for patients with uh, suspected or diagnosed upper tract disease, obviously family history and hereditary risk is hugely important. Um, and so that's really focusing really on the Lynch syndrome. And so patients who have a family history, especially at young age of uh, family members with colorectal, ovarian, endometrial, gastric, biliary, um, can be prostate, pancreatic, um, uh, lesion should be uh, a referred for genetic counseling for Lynch syndrome um, and universal histologic testing with molecular studies um, with immunohistochemistry and microsatellite instability testing um, to help identify those with a high probability of Lynch-related um, cancers uh, as well as that referral for genetic counseling and germline testing. Right. This is just a reminder. Um, I'm not going to go through this entire slide of really what we're thinking about, and you know the important thing for you know our scenario is, is of course we talked about the other cancers involved with Lynch syndrome. It is the thir third most common cancer that these patients present with. It's an autosomal dominant um, with germline variants in the MMR gene. Um, and so this kind of just talks about uh, based on what that mutation is and where the risk uh, is involved of development um, of the upper tract, of course, that, that being the highest in the MSH2 population. Uh, guideline statement number nine, and I think this is one that really impacts us as urologists. At the time that a patient is diagnosed with upper tract disease, um, there should be a very standardized approach and assessment of the upper urinary tract um, at the time for evaluation. Um, that's both endoscopic evaluation as well as radiographic. Uh, this helps, as you'll see later on, for our clinical assessment, our staging, and our risk stratification. Um, so I think it's important, just like in so many things that we do in urology, to really think forward and think about what your operative report might um, need to include, including the exact location of tumors, the number of tumors, uh, the uh, description, are they flat, are they papillary, um, size, um, size and comparison to something. I think it's quite hard to... Um, uh, identify sizes in the upper urinary tract. So is it bigger, smaller, half the size of a, a ureteral uh, night and all basket and uh, things like that. Retrocode pilogram with a correct radiologic interpretation um, and then maybe a volume measurement of the upper urinary tract if you're thinking about doing a um, any treatment with uh, upper tract chemo in the future. So here might be an example um, of what it shows in the guidelines of, of what some of these uh, tests or what this operative report might look like. Um, and then the question becomes is how do you physically biopsy? Um, as a urologist, we have lots of tools in our armamentarium, but um, you know, with the most common being that we use as urologists as an endoscopic approach, whether that's done in a retrograde fashion at ureteroscopy or an antegrade fashion with an antegrade ureteroscopy. Um, the other thing to consider in patients who you're unable to access in that way um, with larger tumors would be a percutaneous approach by interventional radiology or others. Um, and then the actual technique when you do it endoscopically. Do you use a brush biopsy? There's piranha biopsy forceps. Um, there's backloading uh, large, big forceps. Um, very commonly that stone baskets will be used. Laser excision uh, along with a basket or a piranha grasper. And then selective cytology with or without that barbitage washing. So statement number 10 really you know, says the thing that we talk about all the time in so many things that we do in urology is that we need to risk stratify our patients. Patients um, are low risk or high risk. And I think it's important when we do that to clarify with our patients, is it low risk or high risk of what? Right? Is it low risk or high risk of dying? Is it of progressing, of recurring? Um, and so really it's low risk or high risk of having T2 or more invasive disease. Um, and that's based on all of those things um, that we've talked about that you're going to include in your operative report and from preoperative um, imaging. Um, so like we said, is it low risk? Is it high risk? Is it based on endoscopic appearance, cytology, 
pathologic and histologic um, evidence, radiographic findings. And so basically at this point in time, it is our time that says, you know, a biopsy uh, basically often gives us just grade in the upper urinary tract and a biopsy alone is not good enough. We've got to do better. We've got to take um, size, number of tumors, cytology, location, all of these other things into uh, account. Um, so this is the the take home table for risk stratification that just came out in the 2023 AUA guidelines. I'm not going to go through all this. This isn't something that has to be memorized, of course. Um, but having an idea of what puts patients in low risk and high risk, and then of course, like we do in urology, we've split up that low risk and high high risk into favorable and unfavorable. Um, and those are based on, again, the cytology. Um, is there high grade cytology or is there not evidence of invasion uh, on radiography? The, the focality, is it multifocal or unifocal tumors? And what does the tumor characteristics look like? Are they papillary or flat sessile appearing? Um, and then those risks that are up top in this chart really guide us down um, how we treat patients and what the treatment recommendations are, right? Low risk disease should require low, uh, less in aggressive interventions. High risk disease requires aggressive interventions. Um, and we'll go through this as we, we go through the rest of these guidelines. Um, so, you know, it's important to kind of have an idea of what urinary cytology, I think this is something that's very confusing for patients and it can be quite confusing for physicians as well. And to understand kind of this um, scale of from negative urinary cytology for high grade disease to a positive cytology um, for high grade disease. Um, as you can see that across the board, you know, oftentimes that atypia really will trick us up as urologists. Um, of course, patients with upper tract disease or any patient who's going to be requiring an operation on their kidneys, um, we need to uh, assess their risk for chronic kidney disease um, or the potential need for end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis um, in the future. Um, patients should uh, are obligated to hear uh, a description of all the short-term and long-term risks associated with the diagnostic procedures that we do as well as the therapeutic procedures that we do, um, including but not limited to the need for ongoing operations with endoscopic follow-up, the need for ongoing CT scans for non-endoscopic follow-ups, um, the potential risk of ureteral stricture disease, toxicities associated with both surgical interventions um, as well as systemic, uh, systemic treatments. Um, from a treatment standpoint, also it's strong evidence in the guidelines that tumor ablation shall be the initial management for patients with low risk favorable. Uh, UTUC can be offered to patients with low risk unfavorable um, and to select patients um, with high risk favorable disease um, who have you know single tumors or unable for one reason or another to undergo ne nephroureterectomy. Um, as we go on in, in treatments um, portion of the guidelines, tumor ablation may be accomplished via, re via retrograde or antegrade, uh, percutaneous approach. Um, and the real important thing here is actually that the guidelines tell us that after you do a tumor ablation with a laser, that that patient needs to have a repeat endoscopic evaluation within three months. And I think that's important for us uh, to remember to not let time go by. Um, Following ablation of upper tract disease and confirming no perforation of the bladder upper tract, pa clinicians may uh, elect to instill adjuvant um, chemotherapy uh, or intravesical chemotherapy to decrease the risk of either lower tract recurrence and upper tract chemoablation um, and recurrence. BCG may be offered to patients with high grade uh, disease after complete tumor ablations or those with upper tract uh, CIS. So uh, statement 18 and 19, of course, when tumor ablation is not feasible, as this is not the case for all patients, um, uh, or evidence of risk group progression is identified in those with low risk disease, surgical resection shall be uh, 
uh, shall go on with either a nephroureterectomy or segmental resection of the ureter. Um, may offer watchful waiting or surveillance in those patients with severe comorbidities or risk of mortality or significant risk of end-stage renal disease uh, that could lead to dialysis that the patient is not willing to undergo. So as we talk about, you know, more aggressive surgical management in those patients who are requiring surgical intervention, not ablative um, endoscopic management, um, a clinician shall recommend a nephroureterectomy or segmental ureterectomy uh, with potential reimplant if in the distal ureter for surgically eligible patients with high risk um, UTUC, so the right hand side of our table. Uh, for surgically eligible patients with high risk and unfavorable low risk cancers endoscopically confirmed, um, confined to the lower ureter uh, with a good upper urinary tract, distal ureterectomy and ureteral reimplant is the preferred option um, and to salvage the upper tract and salvage the nephrons of the kidney. Again, that's unfavorable low risk and uh, surgically eligible high risk in distal ureteral tumors where a reimplant is possible. When performing a nephew or distal ureterectomy, the intramural ureteral tunnel and orifice must be excised um, and the urinary tract, i.e. the bladder, must be to closed in a watertight closure. Um, and uh, there are randomized controlled trials that talk about perioperative intravesical chemotherapy administered in eligible patients to prevent the, the bladder recurrence. Uh, the timing of, timing of this is not, uh, not said, but somewhere um, between the operation and within two weeks is what majority of the studies show. So what do we do about lymph nodes, right? We know that lymphadenectomy is, is staple and, and part of what we, when we treat urothelial carcinoma of the lower urinary tract of the bladder. Um, but what do we do when patients require um, surgical intervention for upper tract disease? Those with low risk disease, um, it says physicians may perform a lymph node dissection at the time of nephew or segmental ureterectomy. Those with high risk disease, the guidelines say clinicians should perform a lymph node dissection at the time of surgery. So it, progressing on through this disease, it leads us to uh, patients who are diagnosed with high-risk disease who are going to undergo surgery, and should we use uh, chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting? Um, and guideline statement 26 tells us that physicians should offer cisplatinum-based neoadjuvant chemo to those undergoing radical nephroureterectomy or segmental ureterectomy. Um, when their post-op EGFR is suspected to be low, that would preclude them from getting platinum-based chemotherapy post-operatively. Um, and so it's a important for us as urologists to have an idea of what cisplatinum eligibility includes. And of course, that includes performance status as with any chemo, peripheral neuropathy, um, hearing loss can, can be something a patient could not get cisplatinum for, um, heart heart failure, um, and then of course renal function. So in those patients um, who uh, go on to surgery and have aggressive disease, adjuvant-based pl platinum chemotherapy um, can be offered to patients um, after nephew or ureterectomy if they did not already receive neoadjuvant therapy, so that's T2 and above. Um, or any patient with node positive disease. In patients who received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, who also have this pathology of T2 or above or in positive, um, can undergo adjuvant nivolumab therapy for one year. Um, this would also include those patients with poor pathology T3 or above if they were ineligible or unable to uh, receive cisplatinum neoadjuvant or adjuvant. So what about patients who present um, from the get-go with metastatic disease or aggressive disease in patients uh, with M1 or M-positive disease? Um, there is no advantage to treating the primary for a curative or oncologic outcome. Um, so uh, for upper tract metastatic disease, nephroureterectomy, ureterectomy should not be offered as any initial therapy. 
um, with patients who have clinically positive lymph nodes, patients would be recommended to have be treated systemically, and then a discussion based upon response for consolidative surgery with lymph node dissection may be performed in those with partial or complete response. This is based on expert opinion alone. <clears throat> Patients who have quote unquote unresectable UTUC or those who are ineligible or absolutely refuse surgery could be offered a clinical trial or best supportive care, including palliative management. This often can be things such as radiation, any systemic therapies, any endoscopic therapies, um, any ablative techniques, um, uh, embolizations uh, for any refractory symptoms such as ongoing um, uncontrollable hematuria. So then, you know, where oftentimes upper tract can be a bit uh, confusing and figuring out what we need to do, and even the guidelines are for the most part based upon expert opinions, but once you treat somebody with endoscopic management or even with nephroureterectomy, how do you follow them there out? So the next, you know, the very last portion of the guidelines kind of go through the surveillance and the long-term outcomes and survivorship of patients with upper tract disease. So low-risk patients who have endoscopic management or are managed with nephron-sparing treatments shall undergo cystoscopy follow-up and upper tract endoscopy, like we said, within that first three months to confirm treatment success. Uh, once you have a complete response, surveillance of the bladder every six to nine months for two years then can be stretched out to yearly. Um, and the same thing with ureteroscopy should be performed at repeat at six months and again at one year. Upper tract imaging with CT scans should be performed every six to nine months for the first two years and then annually thereafter. High risk patients um, shall do the same uh, within one to three months. Uh, with those without any evidence of disease, the timeline just shortens. Instead of six to nine months, it goes from three to six months, and that goes on for three years, and then annually thereafter um, versus the two years in the low-grade disease. Um, endoscopy repeated again at least at six months in follow-up and one year later with the imaging again every three to six months. Despite uh, with the low-grade, it was six to nine months. Um, and um, on from there. Um, so patients who develop urethelial recurrence in the bladder or urethra or a positive urinary cytology after having treatment for upper tract disease should be evaluated for ipsilateral recurrence if this is a patient who was managed endoscopically or development of a new contralateral uh, occurrence. So this is very important for us that we need to do our repeat um, axial imaging um, in this patient population. As we move on, um, how about those individuals who proceed on to radical nephroureterectomy? What do we do and how do we follow them in the long term? Um, so any patient with less than T2 disease or N0 disease um, should be followed with cystoscopy, the first cystoscopy within three months, um, and then repeated uh, thereafter. For low grade, this is every six to nine months for two years, high grade three to six months for three years. So if we really think back, that's really kind of the key is that um, three to six months for high grade over three years and six to nine months for low grade over two years. Um, due to the metastatic risk and estimated 5% probability of contralateral disease, it is important that these patients who have had a nephroureterectomy continue to have axial imaging um, after surgery um, uh, within the first six months and then at least on an annual basis for up to five years looking for that 5% contralateral disease as well as following them with cystoscopy and urinary cytology. For those patients at the time of nephroureterectomy or segmental ureterectomy with a higher stage tumor, so T2 or above, um, again, we need to look back inside with a cystoscopy and cytology at three months, and then again, every three to six months for three years, right? So those with a higher stage, it's higher T stage, get treated like our high grade patients. 
um, every three to six months for three years with that ongoing cross-sectional imaging every three to six months for the first two years, every six months at year three annually thereafter. This is with a CT chest as well as uh, CT urography. Looking for the local uh, contralateral and distant metastases. So obviously I'm not going to go through this, um, this slide or this uh, table for you, but it's, it's in the guidelines now and it's a very quick and easy way um, once you really start talking in this low risk and high risk, favorable, unfavorable um, uh, way to, to think about upper tract urothelial carcinoma um, and uh, and you know our our follow up guidelines really follow those risk stratifications if you really sit down and think about it and look at it so in wrapping up towards the end of our guidelines um you know and and this is where it comes so important when you're studying for the in service exam um is just really understanding and knowing these um guidelines and thinking about how patients are going to follow up uh, patients uh, with reduced or deteriorating renal function, of course, following surgery, um, you should consider referral to nef nephrology. This is not just true for upper tract disease, but definitely one of the next steps in many of the diseases that we treat as urologists, so that can always be a, a correct test answer. Uh, and then at part of that, patients or physicians should discuss disease-related stressors and risk factors um, for patients. So uh, those patients with upper tract disease to encourage to adopt healthy lifestyle habits, um, you know, smoking cessation can be so important, exercise, healthy diet, um, and to encourage and promote the long-term health benefits and quality of life um, overall. This is also very important when, you know, patient has declining renal function um, and can also be reiterated along with our primary uh, care physicians and nephrologists. So uh, I think this is an exciting time because we have guidelines now from the AUA for rare diseases such as upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Uh, but anytime guidelines come out and a lot of them are, you know, there's several based on evidence and a lot based on um, expert opinion. Uh, it is our role as urologists to learn these guidelines and to put them into practice so that we can ongoing um, change guidelines as they need to be changed and monitor our progress, monitor our adherence um, to uh, these processes um, that are set in place for us by the AUA. So in conclusion, um, just thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to, to be here and talking about this. I'm always open to ask, answer any questions that anybody has. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, and hopefully this was a good prep for uh, any in-service or uh, exams, um, board exams that, that people may have and uh, a good review of the, the late breaking uh, guidelines from the AUA. Thank you so much.